Hello, how is everybody doing this weekend? Yes, I got the oxygen off. I'm doing much better. Uh, thank you all for your prayers. Without your prayers, I would not have been sustained and strengthened. God in his kindness has blessed us richly. Hope and pray that you are doing well, that God is blessing you. Uh, we're continuing in our study in Acts chapter 21. Last week in Acts 20, we got to see Paul basically leaving, finishing off his trip uh, up through Europe and what's now Turkey and uh, coming back now uh, to Caesarea and then on into Jerusalem. And uh, he had to say goodbye and the people told him he had to tell them he wouldn't see them again, which broke their hearts. Um, we want to look at living for Jesus. Sometimes when you live for Jesus, you have to say goodbye, but you're going to get to see him again. We're going to have an eternal reunion. But in the meantime, we've got work to do because the goal of the Christian life is in heaven. The goal of the Christian life is living for Jesus down here. And so we want to learn to live for Jesus like Paul and his companions here are living for Jesus. And like I said, we'll be in Acts 21 and getting to the coast of basically what's now Palestine, uh, getting the close to what's now Lebanon, and uh, then coming into Jerusalem for what looked pretty good for a while until some Gentile, some Jews from Asia decided to uh, make some bad assumptions, all right? Uh, so let's pray, and then we'll get into our study in Acts 21, all right? All right. Dearest, loving Heavenly Father, we pray your grace, your kindness on each listener today. Help each one of us to decide to live more fully for you, to strive to love you more, and to live in such a way <coughs> that those around us love you more as well. Thank you so much for all the kindness you've shown us. Uh, Father, help you. For, thank you for helping us, for getting us through our trials. Uh, we could not do anything without you. Watch over us this day. Help us glorify your son. In his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, and uh, as we finished off, this is another we passage. So uh, since Troas, they've had Luke with them. And so he doesn't talk about they. He talks about we, all right? It says, verse 20, uh, 21, verse 1, it says, And when we had parted from them and set sail... We came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes uh, Islands in uh, the northern Mediterranean, and from there to Patara, and having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we, could, uh, when we had come in sight of Cyprus, remember the island that uh, Paul went to in Acts 13, uh, where he baptizes the governor, Sergius Paulus, has to blind a, a, an, an opposing sorcerer, bar Jesus, Elymas. Uh, anyway, that's uh, Cyprus. Leaving it on the left, we sailed on to Syria and landed at Tyre. Tyre and Sidon are close to Tel Aviv. And uh, landed at Tyre, and from there, the ship was to unload its cargo. Having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Okay, remember last week, they kept telling him, if you go, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be imprisoned, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to, and he said, you're breaking my heart, I got to go. And they're telling him the same thing here. Uh, verse 5, it says, when our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us uh, until we were outside the city. Kneeling down on the bench, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. See, these guys are on their mission trip. They have to say goodbye to their wives and children and the other people that came with their wives and children. They had to, had to take off as well. Uh, if you remember back in, in 1 Corinthians 9, as the disciples would go out preaching, it says they would bring their wives with them. Uh, Paul and Barnabas didn't have uh, wives to bring with them, but the others did. And so uh, 
they take off and Paul's on his way because remember, Paul wants to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. We talked about that last week. Uh, he's already spent a week, a uh, week and a half, uh, before he, uh, after the Passover. Uh, and so he's got a short window of time because he's only got seven weeks from the, from the Passover to Pentecost. And he's trying to get Jerusalem while that big crowd's there at Pentecost, all right? <coughs> it says, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, again, along the coast uh, by Tyre, below Tyre, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. And on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, again, along the coast there, uh, closer and closer to Jerusalem. Uh, and there we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Uh, the last time we saw Philip in Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit lifted him out and brought him to Caesarea. And now, 21 years later, he's still there. It's possible to preach 21 years in the same place. I know that because it looks like Philip has done that. And in the process, he's had four virgin daughters uh, who prophesy. Now, to prophesy, this is not basically something that you do in church because they were told not to do that in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. But here in public, they go out and tell people the message of God. And they just stand out in the street corner and you can just speak the message of God by prophecy. And his four daughters had been doing that there in Caesarea, I guess, blessing him also in his ministry. And so on the next day, uh, it, it says, while we were staying, verse 10, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and his own hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, this is the same Agabus back in chapter 11, 28, who uh, came down and to, oh, down, but it was north, up to Antioch of Syria, where Paul and Barnabas were preaching, and said, we're going to have a famine in Jerusalem. We could use your help. And so the Gentile churches sent, sent uh, contributions uh, down to uh, bless the church there in Jerusalem. Well, now he takes Paul's belt, ties up his own hands, ties up his own feet, and says, this is how they're going to treat Paul in Jerusalem. Okay, so you're Paul. You know that if the Holy Spirit says, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be imprisoned. They've been telling you that, but now he's giving you an object lesson. So you can see for sure. You still going to Jerusalem? Remember how they were amazed at Jesus in Luke 9, Luke 19, excuse me, when he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem? He knew he was going to die in Jerusalem. He had told the disciples he was going to die in Jerusalem. But he went anyway because his purpose was more important than his personal safety. So's yours. So's mine. Right now in America, we've got it pretty good. But 2 uh, Timothy 3.12 is still in there. For indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Don't like it, but it's going to happen. But right now, while we have ability, let's use what ability we have to glorify our Father, even at personal cost. Right now, they're not going to persecute you, but you may lose out on promotions. You may not get invited to certain parties. But living for Jesus is way, way, way more important. Right? Okay. So, <clears throat> he says, that's how they're going to treat him and hand him in the hands of the Gentiles. Verse 12. And when we heard this, we and the people uh, there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he wouldn't be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. They tried to persuade him. Paul, you could, you could live longer here. We, we want you to live longer here. It's kind of like, I don't know if you remember in John 12, a group of Greeks came up after the uh, triumphal entry and, and found Philip, who has the most Greek name of the disciples. And he and Andrew, 
basically go to Jesus and say, hey, these Greeks want you to, uh, to save you from the Jews that are trying to kill you here. And Jesus says, no, unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it abides by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You know, he says, I'm willing to die. And Jesus knew that. And now here's Paul following him saying, whatever it takes, I'm willing to die. But Paul knows something. God told Paul, you're going to preach the gospel in Rome. So Paul knows he's going to get arrested and sent to Rome, which is exactly what's going to happen. But that's not the plan. But God's sovereign and he gets his will done. Okay? So, <coughs> let the Lord's will be done. He's sovereign. Verse 15. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple uh, with whom we should lodge. Uh, guys, be given to hospitality. Nason was blessed by showing hospitality. Can you imagine having the Apostle Paul and some of his friends stay at your house? What would the conversation be like? Wouldn't it be amazing? Do that. There are people here now. There are missionaries going overseas that need a place to stay while they're out raising funds. There's other ministers on the way. They need, have them at your house. Let them stay at your house. We got an extra bedroom. Somebody comes by, it's available. You, okay, Hebrews 13, verse one and two, it's not a suggestion. He commands them, do not neglect to show hospitality. We need to work on that one. That's an important command. So Nason, he's blessed because he shows hospitality. Verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. You remember back in Acts 9 when Paul gets to Jerusalem? They're scared to death of him because he's been killing Christians. But Barnabas talks with him, takes him under his wing, and it works out. Well, now when he comes back, years later, it's like, hey, you know, he's received gladly. Verse 18. On the following day, Paul went with us. Uh, to James and all the elders were present. Okay, so James, these are Jews, but Luke is with them and it's because it says us. And so Luke's a Gentile, but still they, Christians have a bond that is stronger than Jew and Gentile. Okay? And so they received us, verse 19, after, <coughs> sorry, uh, after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul's basically given a mission report. Here's what's been going on as I've been going out on these missionary journeys. Here's all these Gentiles been brought to Christ in all these different cities and uh, up in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And he goes through all this, okay? It says, uh, <coughs> and when they heard it, they glorified God and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands among the Jews of those who have believed, they are all zealous for the law and they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews uh, who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to our customs. He, he just tells them this great mission report. And they're really thank, thankful about all the Gentiles being brought to Christ. And then they say, okay, let's cut to the chase. We got a problem here. There's thousands, thousands of Jewish Christians and some of them have been told a lie. And the lie they've been told is that you don't follow the law of Moses and you encourage other people not to follow Moses and you tell people not to circumcise their children. And Well, he tells the Jews not. He doesn't tell the Jews not to circumcise their children. He tells the Gentiles not to circumcise their children. Okay, now he had Timothy circumcised even though his dad's Greek. But Timothy's mom was Jewish and so he was allowed to go into the temple and in in, in, into the uh, synagogues if he had been circumcised. And so to better help Paul in his ministry, he has Timothy circumcised. He turns right around Titus, who's a Greek. He doesn't have him circumcised because even if he gets circumcised, he still can't go in the temple. He still can't go in a synagogue. And so the other was to help with ministry, not to make him closer to God. The circumcision was not about being closer to God because that covenant's over. We're not under that Jewish circum that circumcision covenant. We're, we're, we're born in Christ, Jew and Gentile alike. <coughs> so, uh, like I said, they've been, told, they've been told that you're telling people to forsake the law of Moses. 
And so, verse 22, they said, well, then what's to be done? They will certainly hear, okay, uh, that you've come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there's nothing in uh, what these people are saying about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law. Okay, I if you remember back in uh, Acts 18, verse 18, when Paul was in Secrea, he took a Nazarite vow. If you read back in number six, a Nazarite vow, you shave off all your hair. I mean, beard, hair, eyebrows, everything. Shave off all your hair. And for the whole time of the vow, if it's for six months, if it's for a year or two years, the whole time, you never cut your hair. And it just gets going longer and longer and longer. And at the end of your vow, you, you cut it off. It, it, it's, a, it's basically it's a vow of, of a communion uh, period with God. And, uh, and so uh, <coughs> they said, hey, we've got four guys getting ready to take a Nazarite vow. And uh, they have to pay, the, if you read about the sacrifice stuff, that's all back in Numbers chapter six. Uh, he said, we want you to go with them and we're gonna give you the money so that you can pay their sac- for their sacrifice so that all the Jews can see that you follow the traditions of Moses. What a great idea. I mean, if you wanna shut down people's gossip and rumors that are not true, you put something obvious that people can see. And here's five guys now who are going to take this Nazarite vow. And this one guy that they've heard all these things about, he's going to pay for them to have their head, you know, for the vow so that they can have their head shaved and have the whole Nazarite vow thing. Now, no. Does that make a Christian closer to God? No. But does it help him relate to the people in the community so that he can, so that he can talk to them about God? Yes. Okay. You know when Jesus was born? Sometime, maybe December, maybe January, maybe February, maybe March. I mean, we don't know. But if you don't put up a Christmas tree, your neighbors think you don't believe in Jesus. And so you don't just put it up because you're trying to celebrate a specific day that Jesus was born because we don't know. You put it up so that you can honor Jesus with your life. And your neighbors, you can relate to them better. Because there's more people willing to listen about Jesus in December than any other month of the year. And so we need to relate to them. Well, here, the elders say, Paul, this is a great way to relate to your Jewish neighbors. You take this Nazarite vow. It's going to work. And it would have worked except for some uh, Asian Jews. Let's see what happens. Okay, so he says, you guys should have, it'll all work out. Uh, Verse 25. It says, but as for the Gentiles who have believed, we've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. That was back at the Jerusalem conference back in Acts 15. It says, then Paul took the men, the four men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, went into the temple giving notice Uh, when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. So here comes these five guys in, all their heads shaved, all their beards gone, okay? To put this in context, if you shaved off my beard, I'd look different. I tell people it covers up some of my ugly, all right? But if you shaved off my beard, I'd look different. And if they shaved off their hair, because they had longer hair than we do, so shave off their hair, shave off their beard, you look a lot different. And so Paul's got these four guys with him. And the Jews from Asia, watch what they assume. They don't know, they assume. Starting in verse 27, it says, when the seven days were almost completed, okay, of this whole purification process to go for the Nazarite vow to be instituted. It says, The Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the temple and against the law and against this place. Moreover, he's even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. He didn't bring Greeks. These are four Jewish men from the church there in Jerusalem. The men from Asia don't know that. They don't know these four guys. And after their heads shaved off, yeah, after their hair shaved off, 
I think one of them either looks like Tychicus or Trophimus. The, remember in Acts 20, Paul brought with him two of the Gentiles from Asia. So the two Gentiles he brings from Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus, one of these bald guys, not bald, one of these guys with their head shaved, I think looks like Tychicus or Trophimus, or maybe two of them do. <coughs> For whatever reason, these guys say they brought Gentiles into this place. Bringing a Gentile in the temple is not, 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 not allowed. There were 21 signs posted around the raised stage up into the court of Israel that said any, in three languages, any Gentile going beyond this marker has himself to thank for his own ensuing death. They were serious, okay? And so you're not supposed to bring a Gentile in there. I mean, being a Gentile in there, it's your death. Bring a Gentile in there, it's your death. And so they're going to take, because they, they assumed that he brought a Gentile in there, and so they're going to go in and grab Paul and take him out. This is serious stuff. So, uh, <coughs> it says, verse 29, for they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So they think Trophimus is one of these guys with the head shaved because you look different when your hair is shaved off. When all the city, okay, then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple and at once the gates were shut and they were seeking to kill him. Uh, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. And he took soldiers at once. He took soldiers uh, and the centurions and ran down to them. And uh, when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Okay, on the north wall, on the northwest corner, okay, was the Antonian fortress of the temple. And there was a stairway that came down from the Antonian fortress. And these guys are like, when they find out what's going on, they just run down this stairway into the court of the Gentiles. They're allowed into the court of the Gentiles. And so the doors have been shut to the court of Israel, and now they're out in the court of, of the Gentiles. And these guys run down the steps and basically <coughs> save Paul because the people are going to kill him. But when they see all the soldiers, they back off because they don't want to get in trouble. The, the Jewish uprisings cost a lot of lives. And so they, they stop what they're doing because they don't want to get arrested and killed. And so they, they stopped as soon as they saw the tribune and the officers come down. Okay. Verse 20, 33, it says, then the tribune came up and it rested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. That's going to be key. Uh, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some were shouting another. And as he couldn't learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought up into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of people followed, cried out, away with him, away with him. It's pretty bad. It's so bad they have to carry Paul up these steps back into the Antonian fortress. And so as they're hauling him up these steps, chained up, uh, they're saving his life from the mob, but they're not treating him very nicely. Who's Paul? Well, he's an apostle. Who's Paul? He's a Roman citizen from the town of Tarsus. Are you supposed to chain up a Roman citizen without a trial, without, I mean, let's see what happens. Verse 37. <coughs> As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, so they've got him now up to the top of the wall, ready to go into the barracks, into the Antonian fortress. He said to the tribune, uh, may I say something to you? Well, he said it in Greek. And so he said, may I say something to you? And he said, oh, do you know Greek? And he said, well, then, are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men uh, of the Assyrians out in the wilderness? Nope, that's not me, Paul says. I'm somebody else. 
Uh, so Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. You can just see this officer's face drop. It's like, what have I done? I put chains on a guy who's a Roman citizen. I bound him up here. I had him viciously carried up. He said, I should have treated him a whole lot nicer. He, he can have my head. Okay. I mean, you can just see all these thoughts going through this, uh, this officer's head. But Paul says, yeah, I'm a citizen. See, Paul's not trying to get persecuted. He's not trying not to get persecuted. He's trying to live for Jesus. He's trying to glorify God. And right now, his Roman citizenship is going to help him speak the word of God to people. And that's what he, everything Paul has, he uses it so that he can glorify God, so that he can tell the word of Jesus to people. Guess what we should be doing with our blessings? Are you a citizen of the United States? Use that blessing to share the message of Jesus with people. Do you have a job? Use that blessing to share the word of Jesus with people. Do you have a Bible? Do you, can you, whatever you have, you do it to the glory of God. Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Everything we do, we're doing for him. That's what Paul's doing here. And so uh, Paul says, I'm a, I'm a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to these people. Now, Paul could have ordered him because of the way he had just been treated. But that's not the way Paul communicates. Paul didn't want to force people. See, God doesn't want you to have to serve him. God wants you to want to serve him. And so Paul's giving these people a chance not to have to do what's right, but to want to do what's right. And so he begs him to let him speak to the people. Good heart, good way to communicate, good way to relate to people. There's a reason why Paul was so effective in evangelism. And I think this heart has a lot to do with it. It's kind of like Romans uh, 2 verse 4 says, For indeed, uh, uh, see, <coughs> sorry, wrong verse. That was uh, uh, second ten, first, Romans 2 verse 4. It says, Know ye not that it's the kindness of God that leads men to repentance. Okay. So it, it says, uh, verse 40, And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hands to the people, and there was a great hush, and he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Okay, just as he talked to this uh, Roman soldier in Greek, now he talks to them in Hebrew. He's, <coughs> he's very linguistically ta talented, but the thought is he cares enough to speak to people where they are. We need to speak to people in their language. How do they relate to things? You try to talk to them, and, and you don't try to impress them with your 50-cent words you learned when you were in college, okay? You just talk to people where they are. And so that's what Paul does. He's going to talk to people where they are. So now Paul has a chance to defend himself. In all this next chapter, Paul, ha Paul has been given this opportunity. He's up on this high stage, right on the basically almost the top of the wall of the temple, going into the door into the Antonian fortress. And he's standing out there on this little porch, basically up there. And so now he's able to address the people. He's got his own amphitheater because all the people are down below uh, in, in this huge court, courtyard so big you could play six, uh, six uh, football games in that one courtyard, which is huge. And so he's up there able to address this whole crowd. God has really set this up. What looked like it was going to be a terrible persecution and a death for Paul is now an opportunity for him to speak. And so now he can defend himself. You know how he defends himself? That's chapter 22. That's going to be next week. But he defends himself not at all. He uses this opportunity to tell people how amazing Jesus is. We could learn from that. But that will be next week. All right. Living for Jesus that's what life's about. Keep it up. Let's do it better. I think we can. May God richly bless you and Jesus give you peace. See you next week.